Well, hey, my friend, welcome back to the show. My name is Deanna Yates, and you are listening to episode 211 of the Wannabe Clutter Free Podcast. On today's episode, I am chatting with Colette Roy, and we are going to talk about clutter and couples. How clutter affects our relationships, especially the relationships within our home, our significant others particularly. And it is a really interesting conversation. In fact, Colette has written the book on couples and clutter, so we're definitely going to get into some really interesting stuff. But before we start, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate that you are here and I will do my best to help you walk away from this episode with information that you can take and apply into your life right away. All right, let's learn about Colette. Colette has been obsessed with organizing since she was a little girl and had a super tiny bedroom. Her need to keep everything in its place was crucial to her well-being. From there, her obsession with organization evolved into systems she created to operate her residential cleaning company and graduating from the University of Colorado. A decade later, she closed the biz and hightailed it to the Caribbean to learn how to sail with her new husband. During that adventure, she became an overnight minimalist since she was carrying all her belongings. I definitely know what that is like when we traveled. Same thing kind of happened to me. Upon returning back to her beloved Colorado after five years of nomadic life, she started her next career as a professional organizer where she worked with many clients over the past two decades. Her book, Clutter and Couples, The Guide to Organize Your Home and Transform Your Relationship is a direct result of observing how clutter affects us all, especially how it affects our relationships. So give this episode a listen, and when you're done, come on over and let me know what you thought about it. You can connect on Instagram. I'm at wannabe clutter free. You can come on over to the wannabe minimalist Facebook group and comment over there, or you can share this episode with a friend or leave a rating and a review wherever you prefer to get your podcasts. And if you want more show notes, go ahead and head over to wannabeclutterfree.com forward slash the number 211. Again, that's wannabeclutterfree.com forward slash the number 211. All right. And now let's get to our conversation. Well, hey, Colette, how are you doing today? I am very well. I'm a little nervous, but I'm excited to be here. This is my first podcast ever interview. So thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. You're going to do great. And I promise I'm very nice. Can you start, though, by telling us a little bit about you and how you got to being a professional organizer and writing your book? What is that all about? Sure. Yeah, I came to Boulder to go to school, which I did. I got my uh, degree in speech pathology and communication disorders. And then I was seeing a whole bunch of clinicians who were in the field and they were super unhappy. And I thought, Oh, I'm not going to spend another $30,000 so I can be unhappy. That doesn't sound like a good idea. So at that time, I was house cleaning very part time for a few folks. And I thought, well, I love the flexibility. It was my first experience of not working in an establishment. And it was at that point, once I moved away from I'm going to be a house cleaner to I'm going to be a business owner, it was off to the races. That was the permission to become an entrepreneur and set my own schedule and have a lot of flexibility and freedom in my life, which was wonderful. And I built that cleaning business and had 14 employees by the time I closed it. And it was a decade chapter of my life that I was very happy to close when I was ready. It was a lot of stress and a lot of work. And I actually took off from the Caribbean to learn how to sail with my then brand new husband. And so We hightailed it out and went and had this wild adventure for five years. And then I came back and thought, I had one of my clients in the days of cleaning. She said, would you help me organize my craft room? And I said, yes, I will, joyfully. And I didn't know how joyfully until afterwards. And I thought, oh, my God, you're going to pay me for that? I just had the best time of my life. So that was where it started, where I thought, oh, if I could do work that I absolutely didn't feel like I was working, let's play there. And it was juicy. It was juicy. It was so fun. And so I have been doing organizing work in Boulder for the past 20 years. And just being in people's homes is really an intimate thing. It's very, you can imagine, you know, you're inviting a stranger and you need some help and There might be some shame involved. There might be 
you know, trepidation that you're going to be judged for how your home is. And it's just such a wonderful thing because when I walk in, I just go, oh, this is going to be no problem. And they, of course, are just in the state of overwhelm and not feeling good about a lot of things. So it's really nice to be of service in that way where I'm holding the big picture and they just are being led. And I think a lot of people really don't know what to do. I mean, overwhelm is real. Um, I'm sure you have it in your life and I have it in my life. We all have it. We just have it for different things. And so I would love to just try and get everyone to get off the shame train because there's no sense in that. That's not going to solve anything. So that's where the book came along, where I felt it was, I watched a lot of couples inside, mostly the estimates, really just, it became very clear and evident that they were struggling with each other's stuff and it was affecting their relationship. And that's what the book is about. It's cluttering couples and it's how to organize your home and transform your relationship. And it's really about, well, first and foremost, depicting where clutter comes from, but Secondly, how to transform your relationship with some very important communication tools. Mm, I love this marriage of ideas where you have the not just helping you tackle your clutter, but then also the relationship communication. I think that's so just fascinating. It is a really great, for lack of a better word, marriage. But what you said there about everybody having overwhelm, I think that is so true. And we all become overwhelmed for different areas and different things. And it's because we're all good at different things, right? We all have strengths and we all have weaknesses. And it doesn't mean that you are better or worse. It just means that in one area, you might need a little more help. And in another area, you are going to be able to help someone else. And to help get over that shame part, I feel like if we think about that, like if we think about where we can help other people and when we're the teacher, how do we feel? Do we feel like we're judging these other people for not knowing what they're doing? No, absolutely not. We're excited to be able to help. And so I think if we can understand that when people come into our home to help us organize as you have done, it's more from a place of like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to teach you what I know and make this better for you. And there's never a moment of like, I don't know. Judgment, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. So, yeah, I love that. I love how you said that. One of my taglines on my car, I have a wrap, and it's it's and it's been on my cards and my car and so forth, but it's it, everyone really resonates with it. It says, 100% non-judgmental support. People go gaga for it because we're always all afraid that we're going to be judged. I mean, it's a human condition, but it doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't. We're not in business to judge people. It's really to help people. Totally. A flashbacks to junior high, right? We, do we ever move past junior high? Thank you. That's a wonderful little situation, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm about to have a junior higher in another year. And I am just like, I'm having to deal with my own trauma because, again, I don't want that to be passed on to her. So I'm like, nope, it's her clean slate. She does not come with my baggage. So Anyway, that is a topic for another day, and maybe we'll get into it as we talk about clutter and relationships. But let's dive into that, because I think this is one of the topics that I hear over and over and over and over again when someone starts to declutter. I've worked on my stuff, or maybe they haven't done that part, and that's always the first step, I think. But what do I do with my husband's stuff? He's got a garage filled with stuff. His office is filled. The basement is filled with everyone else's stuff. So let's, I, we'll get into all of that. We'll unpack all of that. But let's start with why this topic interested you the most. I think you teased it a little bit, but what is it that made you dive in and say like, okay, this is the book I want to write? I am a woman who has been in relationship most of her life. I started at age 15 and I went from one to the next to the next until I think I was 50. Two, perhaps. Those numbers might be a little off, but it was a 36-year stint. How about that? And there was a 17-year marriage in there, but there was a lot of threes, a lot of sevens. And so that serial monogamy lent 
to a lot of self-reflection on the curriculums at hand. And I think that's what relationships are. I do believe that they are curriculums and that we are put together to learn all sorts of stuff that we don't even know about. And I am very relational. I'm a Scorpio woman and I love to dive deep into all the goodies. And the goodies are really, I think, what moved us further and further down our path into understanding that we're not victims and that we have a very capable uh, nervous system once we know how to use it and play with it and not be afraid of it. And I think the nervous system comes into play quite a bit inside of these conversations or lack of conversations around clutter inside of couples. And, you know, I don't think that many of us have been taught how to communicate, especially about hot topics or things that we're frustrated with. It becomes very under the shadows and there's a lot of indirect ways that we deal with that. So that's how I came to it. Would just my love for relationship and not just communication, but eroticism. And I'm also a intimacy coach that I've certified with uh, Jaya and I am firmly vested in this concept of the erotic blueprints. And so having a thriving relationship, I'm passionate about, and I want to have other people understand how to have that if they want that. Awesome. I think that's great. That's very fun. I did not know all of this. This is super fun. Okay, that's another topic. We keep this one PG, so we'll we'll have another day maybe where we can do one that's a little bit different topic. But I love the idea, though, that clutter in our home, right, our physical clutter affects so many of our other things, right? It affects our emotional state. It affects our mental state. It affects these relationships because obviously how we deal with these things then is how we kind of go back out and project and react and interact with other people. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, Colette's going to walk us through clutter thresholds, what they are, how they affect us, and what we can do about them. So where do you start? Where do you tell people to start with figuring out, I think you talk about clutter thresholds and that kind of stuff, but where do we start this conversation? Simply because it brings an awareness to the couple of mm -hmm. understanding. And, and they might know, they might have an awareness of like, oh, his crap drives me crazy. Or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I hate when she leaves all of her stuff at the front door. Or whatever the hot spots are inside of the relationship, that they know that they're frustrated and the threshold is so relative. And I think that's such an important term that we should all really embrace and understand that everything is relative. So what might drive you crazy might not affect your partner at all. And then vice versa, there's other things that will really send him over the edge. And you're like, what are you talking about? So in the book, I talk about low threshold and high threshold. When someone has a high clutter threshold, they're typically the person inside of the relationship that is not impacted as much as the low threshold. And so that is a moving target. I don't want to put anyone into a label or a box and I don't want any of you out there to think, oh, my husband's definitely the low or the high or whatever. Don't diagnose. Just recognize how it dances within your relationship because it's going to be different at all levels, I think. But if you are the person who has the high threshold, you're good. Maybe your nervous system isn't going to get fired up. Maybe like your partner, you know, if something gets put on the counter every night and it starts to build, their nervous system might actually start getting activated. It might start getting activated around Maybe they know that it's getting activated. Maybe they don't, but they start to feel something. Maybe they're going to start saying things. Maybe they're going to have a reaction and that will come out in a verbal, maybe attack or maybe a, a, a frustrating moment that probably isn't going to be, hey, your stuff is really starting to amplify my negative experience. It's probably going to come out in a different sideways manner. 
why did you why do you always put your stuff on the counter? All right. These like really extreme, like always you never listen to me. You never you know, you're not putting things where I want them to. Right. Like, I think that's where when we're amped up and we don't know why we're getting these really visceral reactions. Yeah, I really liked what you said about bringing in those definitive terms like always, you never like those are fighting words. And that is creating almost a disconnection. And that's what the book is about. I, I want to try and help people not drift apart because I do feel that clutter can really serve as that. It can be a small little pearl that turns into a tsunami of disconnection. And let's prevent, let's prevent. And let's learn how to talk about the pile that starts, you know, and to be able to say what ends up happening is I feel really nervous and anxious and I don't know why I feel that, but I just start feeling really amped up. And maybe in that moment, your partner can actually hear that and go, yeah, I love you. I don't want you to have to feel that. And that's really a beautiful moment where you're actually caring for one another. Yeah, that's super powerful of just taking it back and saying, like, I don't know why, but this doesn't feel good to me. And then working together, right, instead of blaming and pushing and pointing and yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, the nagging. Absolutely. Nagging. I mean, there's so many indirect ways of communication. And I, again, it's, I think we're doing our best. We're trying our best to get our point across, but we're not doing it in a way that feels caring, direct, loving. So uh, we can change that, though. I want to be very hopeful. I want everyone to feel very hopeful that this is not something that needs that you need to go get a degree on or anything. This is really accessible. And the tool that I have in my book is very, very sweet and very, very loving. It sort of sets the stage for a safe container to bring all things that are problematic, not just clutter. I love that. That's so great. I like it. One more quick break. And when we come back, Colette's going to walk us through how we talk about our own clutter, but more importantly, how we talk about our partner's clutter. It's one you don't want to miss. All right. So what are some of the ways you've seen couples try and get their clutter needs met? Like if somebody is a low threshold, I think we've, we talked about this a little bit, but maybe you have a story you can kind of help us see it put into action. Yeah. One of the things that I will say is, and I don't know if we've really touched on it yet, but when I go in for the estimate, what people are focused on is not necessarily their clutter, but it's their partner's clutter. And so getting their needs met typically is to try and change their partner and try and change their partner's attachments to their stuff. I would not say that's the first place to stop. I don't think that's going to be, it's not going to be the most efficacious way to get your needs met. And this is why I feel it's helpful also to have a third party come in because you can get into a polarization situation with your partnership very easily. You know, if you say, I want you to get rid of that, they'll be like, oh, oh never am I getting rid of that now. If you can have a third party ask the questions and not come at it strong and just have them come to their own understanding about, yeah, maybe those college t-shirts aren't necessarily serving me anymore. But what I would say over and over to all of the clients that I would work for is, where is, what's your pile of stuff? Where do you have the attachments? What is it that you can make decisions on that is yours? And th that's a really great place to start because if that person then starts to release some of their own clutter and start to get into a little bit more of a minimalist mindset, it's not always minimalism, but it's just decreasing the inventory. That's what I say all the time. Like, let's decrease the inventory so that we can actually see it. When you start doing that, there's high potential you actually might inspire your partner to release some of their stuff. 
But the whole concept of controlling and directing and having too much attachment to your partner's stuff isn't going to probably be the answer. Oh, I see that time and time again. I do get that question. How do I help my, you know, my husband has a whole pile of sports things he never uses, or he's got a whole collection of this stuff, or the basement's a mess. And it's the first question always is, have you dealt with your own clutter? Is all of your stuff in order? Because I am a firm believer that we can't ask someone to do something that we're not willing to do ourselves. So if we're not willing to look at our own stuff, go deep, deal with our own emotions and all of the stuff that comes up when we're looking at the clutter, because again, clutter, the things in our lives, we're holding on to them because we have a past emotional attachment. We feel guilty about letting something go. We think we might need it someday. There are so many things that we need to go through personally and grow before we can ever ask anybody to do it themselves. And again, you can do it at the same time. You don't have to do it first, right? If you guys are willing to do it together as a couple, that is great. I mean, that's like, that's the ideal. Absolutely. That's the ideal. That's the word I was looking for. 100% the ideal. Yeah. And to have people in separate rooms making their own decisions is really crucial. Because what I see happening is there'll be a moment when wife comes upon object that she doesn't really want to get rid of, but she knows she probably should. She's not using it. She doesn't need it. So what then happens is she'll say, hey, baby, should we get rid of this? And she's now deflecting the decision onto someone else because she doesn't want to do it. And now that the, the partner is now brought into this whole item while they're trying to do their best with their college t-shirt and to keep them separated and to keep them really in their own capacity of what they have decisions for. And, and I said, okay, let's put it to side. Let's put it aside. We'll ask him when we have a whole pile, not one at a time. Let's let him concentrate and we're going to concentrate here. And I do believe that you know, when you do get married, when you do decide to go under one roof, you have an understanding about how much stuff your partner's coming with, right? Don't you think? I mean, there's an accumulation that can happen, yes, but you also can see a certain amount of what their attachments might be before you make that decision. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw that out there to everyone because there's got to be some responsibility in hooking your train to this human who you may have known had some extra stuff and that it's it might not ever go away but you can come up with you can come up with problem solves for sure one of my favorite is coming up with a finite space that you're going to be able to use so whether or not yes we're going to have two bins each of memorabilia like pare it down like that's some serious decision making and if you both are having the same amount, then it also gives a certain level of equanimity of space of because there's a finite amount of space, unless you want to go and get a storage unit, which I would highly recommend not to. Please don't do that, people. Please don't. Don't do that. Yeah. Unless it's like a temporary, we're moving and we're going to put everything here and then we're going to just bring it back, you know, just to have a little bit of a moment. I think storage units definitely have their place and they can be useful but please don't use them for long-term as a long-term solution because you're just putting off the inevitable, right? You have to deal with this stuff at some point and it's expensive. So just deal with it now. Well, we do that in our home. We each have one memorabilia bin. So there's three of us. So we each have one. And I will admit that my husband's and I's are pretty darn full. So we're at that point where if more comes in that we want to keep, we're going to have to go through it and figure out what stays and what goes. I love the container method. I love having that just a parameter, right? Just the boundaries keeps you in line. That's right. And I think too, that can be expanded into, okay, well, maybe it's a shelf in the, we each get a shelf or it doesn't have to be just a bin, but for you to come up with that when you move in, I think, you know, I'm just working on an online course right now of people moving in together and to help this instead of trying to work backwards, it's creating 
parameters beforehand and setting the stage for communication and also just how are we going to manage two households coming into one roof? Oh, that's great. Well, and I think, too, I love how you said that there. There's some responsibility. You knew this person before you, you know, you... I'm assuming everybody dated before they got married and moved in together, right? Like you, I would hope that you took some time figuring out who this person was. And so you know what makes them tick, what they're attached to, and yet having these conversations. So understanding that at some point you knew this stuff was there and it doesn't just magically go away. Things don't magically get resolved without having these conversations. So ah, I love that. Why do you think it's so hard for people to communicate directly about what they want and what they need. Why is that so hard for us? I'm going to speak from my own experience. <laughs> and I, I'm sure it might actually branch out to other people's experiences. But my mom was really afraid of what she called conflict. She's like, oh, Colette, I hate conflict. And she would never, ever have a conversation with my dad about anything that was bothering her. Because I'm not sure why. I didn't know. I just knew she was afraid of it. And so I didn't see any, I didn't see any conscious communication happening in my family. And I thought I was a good communicator because I thought, because I said to my mom, it doesn't have to be conflict. It can just be communication. But yet, as I look back in my, as I've written this book and seen where I've had some issues around not bringing my own stuff to the table, I think it's out of fear. I think it's fear of upsetting the partnership, it's fear of maybe having a blow up or not necessarily being able to not have my own nervous system. And so the book goes into this because it's real, like attachment theory and attachment styles are really a big thing. An anxiously attached person is going to do everything in their power not to upset the relationship because it feels very unsafe. It feels almost like, oh, there's, an, there's, a, there's almost an abandonment situation. And the nervous system gets fired. There could be, then we're dealing with also like retraction or we're dealing with defensiveness or shutdownness. There's so many things why people don't communicate. And to learn how to is really a course that we should all focus in on. Because life can be really pretty groovy when you're not fearful of, saying something that might upset your partner. How can we start to bridge that conversation? Give us a distinct difference between the way that people would have a conflict, like have how does somebody approach it where it's a conflict versus then now instead having that conversation? What's a way you've seen that work out? In my own relationship, it's been we have something that we do once a month. We have this communication tool that we use once a month, and it's usually two to three hours, and we sit down and we do this exercise, and it's basically self-guided therapy, but it's really loving. And so we're setting the stage, but we're also getting in the habit. And I mean, I think we can use this almost as much as we can use getting in the habit of exercising or eating healthy. It's not easy at first. And then people are like, what? Three hours. Three hours. Um. But, I mean, what, a, what an investment in having the connected, safe space to share and evolve and grow together without having fear that it's going to go way off the rails. And then also learning how to repair after it, it does go off the rails, if it does, and it might, but you get better. You know, you can lift 15 pounds at the first week and then maybe 25 week seven, you can get better at things. And I want to really, I just, the platform of learning communication is a big one for me because it solves a lot of issues. It's the core piece that will actually allow you to solve the issues. So it's a good investment. That's, that's what I would say. It doesn't have to be this tool. It can be any tool, but I think having something on a regular basis that you know you have time to sink in and talk and problem solve together will allow for a sense of team versus fighting each other. 
I love that sense of team, right? We're all in this together. We're on the same team. We're on the same team. Yeah, we're on the same team. Let's play together for sure. Yeah. Mm, I love that. And I am a huge proponent of just putting something on the calendar. If it's not on the calendar, it's not going to get done because life just will come on up and kick you in the behind. Something will come up. It always does. So just picking a time. And if you can, schedule those monthly dates together to where you have some time to do this and probably will get a lot more fun, right? Does it get more fun as after you've done it for a while? I think so. You, yeah, we've been doing it. Today actually is our anniversary, our three-year anniversary, which is sort of fun. And we have done it every month since we began our relationship. And it feels like a cozy blanket. That's what I'll say. It's such a touchstone of care. And then also we feel really just very connected. And we feel proud that we're putting the time in to make our relationship feel clean. And like nothing's building up. That's another thing. And I think clutter, it's a really interesting parallel because the clutter can build up really quickly, especially with kids. I mean, when there's more than just two people in a house, it can get really rambunctious pretty quickly. And so recognizing that if you're continually putting things away every night, it's not going to feel overwhelming. But if you let it build, it's going to feel overwhelming. And it's maybe going to have a whole bunch of extra energy on it because you've now been holding it for a while. So it might come out sideways. Mm, the extra energy. Oh, interesting. Well, yeah, at the time of recording this, I have been under the weather for a couple weeks and busy with work stuff as well. I'm working on a big project for work. And so, yes, I will say, right, life ebbs and flows. There's different seasons and different things happen. And the housework has gotten a little put off, right? I actually finally this morning, I feel better finally. I had a little bit of breathing room and I finally started to tackle it again. But it is one of those things where the longer it goes, the harder it is to find the motivation to start. Even me, even someone who feels like they live in a decluttered house and I don't have a lot of stuff. And, you know, it just, it can pile up. The schoolwork comes in, the paperwork comes in, the laundry gets put off on the side. Like things that just happen because you just don't have the energy if you're under the weather or you're working on something big and time really is precious in those moments you know, because we still should be getting sleep. I've not been a good proponent of that either these last few weeks, but I'm trying my best. And so it is, I understand. It is just one of those things. And give ourselves some grace to know that everybody struggles with this sometimes, but we just have to parent ourselves and say, nope, now is the time I'm going to deal with this and it's going to be okay. And if you just start, right, you just take that first little step. I think that's all it really takes to put those dominoes, like just start tipping them over and it'll all start to fall into place. So, oh, so good. I couldn't agree with you more. I really couldn't agree with you more. Inside of the book, I have action steps after each chapter, just small little ones, you know, so that people can actually start to feel what it feels like to open their junk drawer and look into some order. And just that maybe hour, maybe two hour time investment is going to carry you into a momentous state that like you are going to go, oh, I want that in my bathroom drawer now. And so anyway, it's I, I think it's a really important thing to just do those tiny little dominoes. Like you said, you can't do it all in one shot. You can't. I mean, unless you want to have no weekend and that's no fun. Well, and even I just I don't think it's even possible. Even if you have no weekend, there is just too much. Your stuff didn't come in over a weekend. You're not going to get it out in a weekend. I mean, honestly, I think the only way you can declutter your whole house in a weekend, especially if you are a family, is if you have movers come and just take it all out. Like there's just, I don't really think you can do it. And I think that's just so mean to yourself. And your kids are going to hate you for it too. So let's not start with a traumatic experience about decluttering. Let's just be realistic. Yeah. I tell all of my clients, one of the biggest things I have to just keep managing their expectations like, this is a marathon, not a sprint. 
we are not going to get this done quickly. And there's no sense in doing it quickly because stuff just continually comes in. So let's just get some foundational practices in. That's important. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. And let's plug that hole a little bit too, if we can, with the stuff that's coming in. Take a pause. Take a breather. Yes, ma'am. Take a pause on the influx. Yeah. You'll survive. There's plenty of stuff. We can get anything we want whenever we need. So especially when we live where we live. So anything else you want to leave us with before we wrap up? I think covered it really. I think we really nailed it. I think we talked about some of the big pieces that were really important. Awesome. Okay, perfect. Well, Colette, this has been wonderful. Tell people where they can find out more about you. Well, I have a website called Clutter and Couples, and it's all spelled out. And that's .com. And I am pretty much everywhere on the social media world with a YouTube channel and all the goodies. And again, it's all clutter and couples. And it's really, it's a thing. It is a real thing. It is a big, big issue inside of a lot of relationships, I think. So, yeah, for sure. Well, I love it. Well, we will definitely link to all of that in the show notes. So just click on through and you can find Colette there. But before I let you go, I wrap up every episode with three rapid fire questions. And I will try my best to not add on to these. So number one, what does clutter free mean to you? Clutter free for me personally, when I walk in my door, that I feel that I am stepping into a sanctuary, almost like a spa situation, because I want to feel happy to be home. So if it, it, it's okay if things are in the drawers, in a closet, but I need to walk in and see some visual peace. Mm, love that. All right. Low clutter threshold for you, for sure. All right. Number two, what's making you happy right now or in this season of your life? Making this life transition is a really wild transformation in my life to step into a different form of income generation and expressing some of my talents to a larger audience is very exciting and very nerve wracking, but excitement and fear are right alongside each other. Yep. Oh, I love that. Yep. You must be on the right track if you're excited and fearful at the same time. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> and number three, what's a goal you have for yourself this year? To get in my van, I just bought a, my third Westphalia camper van, and to have freedom to build these courses and have community and generate income from a remote place, whether it's my van or Portugal or Bali, who knows, but it's time to go and travel again. Super fun. Well, and that's something we definitely have a very similar story there. I did the same thing, got burnt out. We moved over to Europe. It was only supposed to be a month, turned into the summer, turned into a year and a half. And yeah, when our daughter was five, because we figured out kindergarten wasn't required in the States that we were wanted to live in. So we took off and life changed. And now we live in San Diego, which we actually had never even thought about. But that's kind of what life does for you. It gives you these serendipitous moments where if you just try and just move through the fear. I think there's a lot of wonderful things on the other side. So awesome. Well, good luck to you as you're moving into this new transition. I think it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's really, it's been a wonderful first interview. Thank you. You were really charming. Thanks. Oh, my pleasure. Lovely to have you. And if you haven't grabbed a copy of the book yet, please do so. Go to those links and get the copy and check it out because it's going to be a great read. All right, everyone, have a great day. I loved this conversation with Colette. I know she was nervous when she started because she's never done a podcast episode before, but she did a great job and gave us some really interesting tips. I also love that we connected on our connection in Boulder. We were trying to figure out if we knew any of the same people before the episode started, but we did. We do end up knowing some of the same people and it's just really fun. I love being able to connect with people all over the world through this podcast. And sometimes it shows me that the world is smaller than we thought. 
But I would love to know your thoughts on this episode. Were there any aha moments, any ways you look at how you talk about your clutter that maybe you want to change your language a little bit, or maybe just make it a little bit easier to bring up that conversation with your partner? I would absolutely love to know. Come on over to the Wannabe Minimalist family group on Facebook and share, or reach out to me on Instagram. I am at wannabe clutter free on all the social channels, but I am most active on Instagram. And if you'd like to help a little bit more, you can also leave a rating and review for this show wherever you listen to your podcasts. Of course, special thanks to Colette for joining us on the show today and sharing some wonderful advice and tips for us. Remember, you can get more detailed show notes for today's episode at wannabeclutterfree.com forward slash the number 211. Again, that's wannabeclutterfree.com forward slash the number 211. Until next time, take care, be open and honest in your conversations about clutter with your partner, and remember that I believe in you. You can do this. I'm Deanna Yates, and you've been listening to Wanna Be Clutter Free. I'll see you next week. Cheers. Cheers.